to follow in the footsteps of Jesus. That's what we're called to do. That's what our purpose is about. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 1, Paul said, follow my example as I follow the example of Christ. And so the way that you and I do that today, we get into books like Matthew and Mark and Luke and John. And we read about the life of Christ and we see how, how Jesus treated people, how he interacted with people, how he had compassion on people and loved people and took care of people. And we come to understand and appreciate that. In fact, that's one of the great ways that we model the character of Christ is, is we seek to love. In John 13, in the shadow of the cross, he said, A new commandment I give you that you love one another. As I have loved you, so that you must love one another. And by this, all men will know that you are my disciples. I read a book some time ago about church growth. And the author, it doesn't make any difference who it is, but he said something that was interesting. He said, what really attracts large numbers of unchurched to a church is changed lives, a lot of changed lives. People want to go where lives are being changed, where hurts are being healed, and where hope is being restored. Can the world see that in us? Can your neighbors see that in you? Can your co-workers see that in you? Can they see Christ in you? Maturity, you see, is not measured by one's learning, but by one's lifestyle. It is possible to be well-versed in the Bible and still be spiritually immature. And so that brings us to this idea of discipleship, of modeling the character of Christ, of being mature in Christ. I'm reminded of one of my favorite stories his mother one Saturday morning was fixing pancakes for two little boys, Kevin age five and Ryan age three. And the boys got into an argument over who's going to get the first pancake. And the mother, being a good Christian woman, thought this is a great opportunity to teach a spiritual lesson. And so she said, she said, now boys, she says, if Jesus was sitting here, he would say, let my brother have the first pancake. I can wait. And the older boy, Kevin, turned to his younger brother and said, Ryan, you be Jesus. <laughs> now, is, is it that, if we're honest, aren't we all a little bit like that? I mean, we want other people to be Jesus. We want other people to be kind and compassionate and forgiving. We want other people to go the extra mile. But do we want to? Do we want to imbibe the character of Christ? and be what he would have us to be. God's purpose for us is to model the character of Jesus. And then number four, his purpose is to minister to others. God expects us to use our gifts, our talents, and our abilities and the opportunities to be able to benefit other people. In 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 11, he says, As each one has received a gift, minister it to one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. I like the statement of Elton Trueblood who said, if you're a Christian, you're a minister. A non-ministering Christian is a contradiction in terms. And I think that's so, that we are all ministers. Several years ago, I went to hear a fellow that was doing a seminar on what they called lay ministry. He was from a denominational fellowship but there was a couple of speakers on the program that I wanted to hear, and I was interested in what this guy said, so I went to his lecture. And I was really taken aback, the first words out of his mouth, because he's doing this ministry, this lecture on lay ministry. And he said this. He said, the idea of a clergy-laity distinction is a product of the Western world and it's not found in the Bible. I was shocked that he said that. And he made the point from Romans 12 and 1 Corinthians 12 that we're all ministers and we have different gifts and abilities and tasks we're to use and we're to minister. And that we've misappropriated this. And then he went on to talk about lay ministry. But what he, said, what he said was true. There's not a clergy laity distinction as the denominational world understands it, that we all are to minister to one another. We look at the early church in the book of Acts and how that they gave to each other in a selfless way and provided for each other's needs and took care of one another. 
in Galatians, whoops, in Galatians 6, oh, now let's see here, I've hit the wrong button here, back, all right, here we go. In Galatians 6 and verse 10, therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, and especially those that belong to the family of believers. I want to be careful the way I couch this, because <clears throat> I don't want to be misunderstood. And we, we have some men in the audience here, like Brother Caldwell and others, that when they go back to the 1950s and the early 60s, have fought some fights dealing with some issues that we believe that are very important to understand about the nature of the church and the work and the organization of the church. But I tell you this, as a kid growing up, I almost always heard Galatians 6.10 talked about in terms of what it doesn't mean. <laughs> instead of what it does mean. And I, I tell you, I, I understand those first 10 verses to be talking about individual responsibility. I don't believe that it's talking about unlimited benevolence as far as the church treasury. So I just want to make that clear. But it's not enough for us to be against something and say how it's the passage is abused. We need to be for something. And what this means is that God's people, his purpose for each of us individually is to do good. To do good to all people, especially those who are part of our own church family. And so we need to stop and think about what are we doing? Are we seeking to do good? Are we seeking to help others? I love the statement by the 18th century missionary Stephen Grellett. He said, I expect to pass through this world but once. Any good, therefore, that I can do or any kindness that I can show to any fellow creature, let me do it now. Let me not defer nor neglect it, for I shall not pass this way again. You know, if nothing else, the parable of the sheep and goats in Matthew 25 ought to remind us that there is much to unpack there about just going about doing good. And those people weren't condemned. They were on the left-hand side that were identified in the Jesus parables of goats because they had done something immoral or gone out and got drunk or violated some doctrine. But they were condemned because they had failed to do good. They had failed to minister to those that were in need and take care of other people. We are called upon to be a minister to others. And then number five, we are to be a messenger of his love. Paul's mission, as he put it in Acts chapter 20, he said, I consider my life worth nothing to me if only I may finish the race and complete the task the Lord has given me, the task of testifying to the gospel of God's grace. And that's our task today is to testify to the gospel of God's grace. God's grace, his love, and his mercy. To Romans, he wrote in chapter 5 and verse 8, that God demonstrates his own love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Paul, when he began the Roman letter in chapter 1, talked about being in debt. And I have thought many times how in debt so many of us are. To those that have gone before us, that have preached the word and established churches and provided opportunities, and we're in debt to be able to share that same message. There's a passage in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, in verses 18 through 20, where Paul talks about his role as an apostle. He said, all this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, God reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting men's sins against them. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are Christ's ambassadors. As though God were making his appeal through us, we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. Now, I understand the context of that passage to really be talking about Paul and the apostles as ambassadors in that sense. And yet, aren't all of us by implication and application, in a sense, ambassadors today? That we are to be messengers of the message of reconciliation and to share the love of God with other people? Each is we have opportunity and ability need to be willing to share that message. 
Just before I got on the plane to come here, I was talking with a good friend of mine, Andrew Roberts, who preaches for the North Livingston Church in Tampa. And Andrew was excited. He said, Ken, i got to tell you, he said, things have been really crazy around here the past couple of weeks. And he had four stories of baptisms, four baptisms. And I won't, take, I won't have time to tell you all four of those, but I want to tell you one of them. And it was the story of a young man. They had a Bring Your Neighbor Day there at Livingston. And a lot of people came that were invited by the members of the church there from the neighborhood and so forth. And one young man came, and he was interested in what he heard, and he came back. And before they really even had a chance to get a study with him, after just, I think, two or three visits, Andrew said he came forward one Sunday morning. And, and so Andrew spoke to him, and he, he understood what he needed to be a Christian. He was baptized into Christ. Let's... Then two weeks later, maybe just 10 days later, Andrew got a call from this young man. He was so excited, he had baptized his brother. His brother had called him and said, you know, what's going on, man? What's going on in your life? He said, well, he said, I, I was baptized. He said, you were what? And he began to tell him his story and how he went to church over there, and how he heard the gospel preach, and how he was told he needed to be baptized to be saved. Well, his brother said, well, I've never been baptized. I guess I'm not saved either. He said, well, let me come over. And so the young man, been a Christian 10 days, went over to his brother's house, took the same scriptures that Andrew had showed him, showed him to his brother, and his brother said, I want to be saved too. And he baptized him right then in his swimming pool. Isn't that incredible? That's being a messenger of God's love. And I have seen that type of story played out over the past 50 years over and over again. There's so many times new converts are even more excited about sharing this message than maybe some of us are that have been Christians for so many years. We're to be a messenger of his love. Now, in wrapping this up, turn your Bibles to Acts chapter 2. I want to bring all this together and to show you that in one text we have all five of these purposes that we talked about tonight. This is a very familiar passage to almost everyone, if not everyone here. So I won't set it up. You know it was the day of Pentecost. It was Peter's sermon that they heard it and they were cut to the heart. Men and brethren, what shall we do? Peter said, repent and be baptized. And then it says that they, those that gladly to receive the word were baptized in verse 41, and about 3,000 souls were added to them. Now look in verse 42. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and in fellowship and in breaking of bread and in prayers. And fear came upon every soul. The many wonders and signs were done through the apostles. Now all who believed were together. And they got all things in common, and they sold their possessions and goods and divided them among all as anyone had need. So, continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily those that were being saved. Now, look at this. They were members of God's family. They understood family fellowship, the togetherness and commonality and outside the assembly of getting together from house to house. They understood God-centered worship and the breaking of bread. I believe that idiom refers to communion and prayers and in praising God. They understood what discipleship was about and they, they followed the apostles' teaching and the doctrine of Christ and sought to mold themselves after him. Selfless service, you think about selling their possessions, selling lands and properties and other things, dividing them up among those that had need among their fellowship. And then the evangelistic outreach, the Lord added to the church daily. But how was the Lord adding them? Was it some miraculous thing? Well, no, that implies people were sharing the word. They were teaching. They were telling others about this sermon on the day of Pentecost. They were sharing the gospel message. And they were being added daily. Wow. That's God's purpose for his people, for me and for you and for Southside, and for every congregation of God's people. Well, let me just wrap this up with a little story. This is another one of those that my friend Ralph Walker would say is apocryphal, and he would tell me, Ken, that's all made up. 
And it may well be, it's probably a legend, but it's one of the many legends of the Taj Mahal. The Taj Mahal is regarded as one of the seven wonders of the world called the Jewel of Muslim Art in India. The temple's inspiration was supposedly based on the great love of the Mughal Emperor Shah Jahan that he had for his third wife, Muzma Mahal. When she died, it says that he was devastated, grief-stricken, and he ordered this edifice to be built as her final resting place, and no expense would be spared to honor his beloved wife. Among the legends surrounding this construction, it says that he placed his wife's coffin in the center of this parcel of land and was to build the mausoleum around it. It took 12 years to complete the construction, but as time passed, the sorrow of the Shah had for his wife was overshadowed by his passion for the project. And one day, as the story goes, the prince was surveying the construction site and he bumped his leg against a wooden box and brushed off the dust. And in anger, he demanded a worker throw the box out. But he didn't realize he had just disposed of the coffin of his wife's body. <laughs> you think, well, that, that, that's hard to believe. It's hard to believe that anybody would do that. That we would make that kind of a mistake. That, that you're building, you're building this edifice to honor your beloved wife and you would forget? That's her remains? At the, how could you forget that? But I would ask us tonight, could we build a church building and forget the real reason for which it was erected? Could we plan parties and potlucks and dinners and overlook the deeper meaning of our fellowship? Could we engage in good works and neglect to honor him in whose name they're being done? Could we read our Bibles and go to classes and memorize scriptures, yet truly fail to follow the one who said, follow me? Could we enlarge our church membership without actually converting people to Christ? And could it be that sometimes that our passion for spiritual projects sometimes obscures our focus on the scriptural purpose that are driving the projects? When it comes our time to die and to be buried and for a rock to be erected on our grave site, I would suggest, ladies and gentlemen, there could be no better epitaph on our tombstone than the one describing David. He served God's purpose in his own generation. Yes, you may stand at ease for a few minutes.
Well, we'll ask that you'll come to your places, please. Thank you so much. Brother Welliver, Welliver continued the streak of just some outstanding, powerful gospel preaching. Ken and I have talked about going on the road together to preach. We're going to call it the long and the short of it. <laughs> Russ Bowman has been bringing his family to the lectures even when his girls were little. I can still remember them at some of the meal appointments. And when Russ comes to Southside, it's, it's coming home. He has been a part of Pasadena since he was 14 years old. And his dad moved the Bowman family from Lubbock to come and preach at Southside. And so in the truest sense, he is a son of this congregation and is loved for his preaching and his plain spoken style. Russ has chosen in consideration of our theme to preach lectures from the Old Testament scriptures. And he has written a lot on the Old Testament and preaches a lot on the foundational issues of the Old Testament. And for his first lecture, when God was the bread of heaven for Israel and that bread that continues to feed us unto eternal life. Brother Stevens is going to lead one song, and then we're going to welcome home another time our brother Russ Bowman. Tim? Guide me, O thou great Jehovah. Ooh. If you have your Bibles with you this evening, I'd ask you to open them to Exodus chapter 16. Put your bookmark there. We'll spend uh, pretty much all of our time here this evening. Uh, thank you for the invitation to be here. I, uh, it, I, I have to say at the outset, it's, it's, it's kind of different following uh, Ken Wilver. Uh, <clears throat> he's probably six inches taller than I am. And I, I was thinking as he was standing up here teaching... This must be what Bubba feels like all the time. <laughs> so uh, I, I appreciate the perspective on brotherly love and, uh, you know, thinking about trying to put your place in the position of your brethren. And so uh, if nothing else this evening, I, I have great appreciation for Bubba uh, in, in that regard. 
I, I thank you so much for the invitation to be here. As Bubba said, this is home. I, I, I don't know how many times I've told you folks thank you for a thousand different things. Uh, and, and I have meant it every year uh, that I've been here. I, I mean it again tonight. I, I have one thing to add to that because now you have embraced two of my girls uh, the same way that you've embraced me and my family uh, through the years. I, I will say that it's a bit different uh, being here. It's the first time that I've spoken here since dad died. Uh, and the uh, first time I've spoken on the lectures when he wasn't sitting right there. And so it's kind of a strange uh, uh, circumstance for me this evening. And so I, if, if I seem a little distracted, I beg your apology in that regard. Uh, if you look at your brochure before we get started our study, and I do appreciate Bubba mentioning this, uh, you'll notice all the titles for the lessons. And... Uh, what says the scripture about this and what says the scripture about that? And then, and then you've got my topics that don't fill that bill whatsoever like I didn't get the memo. Uh, and either that or I just didn't understand at all what the, the lectures were about. Actually, I ran into Bubba uh, about six months ago when we got to talking about what the subject uh, matter was going to be, what the theme was going to be. And, and what he said to me, and very much the, what he said this evening, is we want to we go back to the Bible and we want to talk about some fundamental things uh, that, uh, and, and put our emphasis upon the Word of God. And, and this is where my mind went. Uh, don't ask me why, it just did. Uh, there are so many fundamental concepts that are introduced to us in the early chapters of the Pentateuch. And I, I, we, we talk about Genesis a lot, uh, and we recognize that Genesis is a book about origins, but what we don't appreciate, I think, very often is how much we come to learn about God through the Exodus story. There are 40 years that take place between the beginning of Exodus and the end of Deuteronomy. Uh, interestingly enough, a period of time that's not so far removed from the period of time that the New Testament covers. And, and, and as we read through this period, and, and this is where the topics all came from, uh, we start learning things about God because God is introducing himself to a generation of people that are going to become the people of God and that are going to serve the purposes of God in their generation and are going to uphold the Word of God and are going to stand fast among people. At least these are God's wishes for his folks. And so as uh, my mind began uh, kind of contemplating, if I was going to start talking to somebody and have the opportunity to talk to somebody about God who knew very little about God, this is where I would start. And so we're going to talk tonight about Exodus chapter 16 and the miracle of the manna. I, I would say this tomorrow morning. <laughs> I know you're going to get excited about this. I'm going to preach for Leviticus chapters 18 and 19. So if you're going to be here in the morning, uh, many of you probably aren't now, but if you were going to be here in the morning, <laughs> you might take the time to read that passage. It is not like reading the Exodus section that David referred to about the tabernacle. It, it, it's not as hard as reading the first few chapters of Chronicles. Uh, it's not like the sacrifices section nor the genealogies of Nehemiah. So... If you're going to be, it probably won't take you 10 minutes to read those two chapters. That would be a help to us. In Exodus chapter 6, when God sends Moses to uh, the children of Israel who are in captivity in Egypt, he makes an observation uh, as Moses gets there and as Moses begins to try to tell the people uh, about his mission there. God, God says to Moses in chapter 6 and in verse 2, I am the Lord. Now, this is the way we read this. He is using his name here. I am Yahweh. And he says, I appeared to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob as God Almighty, but by my name, Yahweh, I was not known to them. I have established my covenant with them to give them the land of Canaan, the land of their pilgrimage in which they were strangers. I've heard the groaning of the children of Israel whom the Egyptians keep in bondage. I've remembered my covenant. Therefore say to the children of Israel, I am Yahweh. 
I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. I will rescue you from their bondage. I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and great judgment. I will take you as my people. I will be your God, and you will know that I am Yahweh, your God, who brings you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians, and I will bring you into the land that I swore to give to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I will give it to you as a heritage. I am Yahweh. And that's going to be the theme in the morning. It's interesting to me that when God introduces himself to these people who don't know him, they've been in Egyptian captivity for 400 years. They remember the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. They have connections to their family gods. There are some examples of faithfulness in the early chapters of Exodus. But when Moses shows up out of the desert after 40 years of being gone from, uh, from Egypt, he comes in with this message about this God that's going to take them to the promised land, just like he told Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. And surely some of them remembered Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, but some of them probably went, huh? Who's Yahweh? Never heard of Yahweh. Even God acknowledges to, to, Abra, to, to Moses. They didn't know my name. They knew me as God Almighty, but they never knew my name. And so what you find in these chapters, not only is the Exodus story, but you find God introducing himself to man. We take for granted so much that we know about God that we actually learn not from Jesus' discourses or the minor prophets or the major prophets or the, the history stories in Samuel and Kings and Chronicles. Much of what we learn about who God is, our concepts, are rooted in these chapters. This is what the Scripture is saying. They're not just convenient stories for us. They help us to understand things like covenant and law. They, they give us a concept about God's deliverance, about his authority, about judgment, about his power, about sacrifice and trust and mercy. Were it not for these stories, we wouldn't understand those things about God. They certainly wouldn't have understood those things about God. And all of these concepts that we have, would be lost on us, and they are important to us. Every lesson that's been preached today has been rooted in these concepts. And so I ask you to turn to Exodus chapter 16. I, I am tempted to read the chapter. I'm not going to do it for sake of time, which is somewhat contradictory to the theme, what says the Scripture, but we're not going to read it all. I apologize. The irony is not lost on me, but we will cover most of it. I want you to, to, to focus upon, if you would, chapter 16 and verse 4. You're familiar with the story. I hope that you are. If you're not, go home and read it when we finish. The children of Israel have been 45 days in the wilderness having left Egypt, and they are in an uncultivated and an uninhabited area, and, and they have run out of their supplies. Remember, they left in the middle of the night. They, they threw their kneading bowls over their shoulders. They took unleavened bread. They didn't even give time for their bread to rise. And they went out, they plundered Egypt, but after a month and a half, now you think about the time frames as you study these sections of history, 45 days eating just what you could carry, how long would it be till you got hungry? Probably a long time before 45 days. And yet that's how long it's been. And the children of Israel in verse 2 begin complaining. Oh, that we died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt when we sat by the pots of meat and we ate to the full. You brought us out to the wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. And Moses' first reaction to this is going to be, why are you griping at us? This is Yahweh's doing. And God's response to Moses is, Behold, I will rain bread from heaven for you. And the people shall go out and gather a certain quota every day that I may test them whether they will walk in my law or not. This is perhaps the most underappreciated miracle in the Bible. If you get to the end of the chapter, it lasted 40 years. Every day except Saturday. There are some impressive miracles in the Bible. Uh, one of my favorite ones happens to be uh, Elisha calling the she-bears out to kill the children for making fun of him as a bald man, but that's neither here nor there. Some of them are much more impressive, the calming of the seas, the walking on the water, the, the multiplication of bread, not only by Jesus, but by prophets themselves. 
But this one stands out. Forty years. Perhaps three million people, 600,000 men armed over the age of 20 that could go to war. You start looking at the numbers and counting the women and the children and the mixed multitude. There are a lot of people for 40 years that God is feeding. Why does he tell us this? What's the scripture really saying to us? I forget which one already this today has, has mentioned Romans 15. The things that were written beforehand were written for our learning so that we through the patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. Well, what is it about this scripture? I know why it was important to them. That's how they survived for 40 years. Why is it important to us? Why does God include it of all the things that happened? Well, that's what I'd like to offer you. I want you to appreciate, first of all, that as we've already read in verse 4, God says very clearly, I am doing this that I may test them whether they will walk in my law or not. Now, David's already done a wonderful job talking about the importance of obedience. If you didn't hear this morning's lesson, please go get it, listen to it, listen to it again. We could play it for every section for the week and we would well cover the subject it was outstanding, which is evidence of what being jacked up on coffee can do for you. But, but it was. It was great. And the whole point was why it's so important to obey God. To not, not, not because of what the crowd, that doesn't tell us what we're... It's not the Pharisees. It is the text and it is the teaching. And, and so what we find here is God at the very outset as he is introducing himself to these people. And you will notice as you go through the text in verse 6, at evening you will know that Yahweh has brought you out of the land. In verse 10, came to pass as Aaron spoke to the whole congregation of the children of Israel. They looked toward the wilderness and behold, the glory of Yahweh appeared in the cloud. The end of verse 12, you shall know that I am Yahweh your God. Do you see what he's doing here? He's not just feeding them he is teaching them he wants them to understand the significance of what he is doing and so what he does is he gives them a bunch of rules <laughs> I, I'm going to give you manna I don't understand all there is to understand the, the, there are only a couple of very limited descriptions in verse 15 uh, the first, uh, verse 14, when the layer of dew had lifted there on the surface of the wilderness was a small round substance as fine as frost on the ground, and they were supposed to gather it, one omer for each person, so that it might provide their daily bread. I don't know how much an omer is. I tried to do a little research on that, and what I have found out is nobody knows what an omer was. It uh, varies from a handful, which makes sense to me, because a handful of flour, if we were to look at it that way, wouldn't make enough dough so that you might have, you know, several uh, small, I would think of them as more like tortillas, uh, flat loaves of bread that you could eat and that, that, that you could eat for a day. That would give you food for a day. So, some estimates are as it's many as 40 cups, which seems uh, overdoing it to me. But I want you to think about what God's telling them to do. Verses 4, 5, and 6. It'll be on the sixth day they shall prepare what they bring in. It shall be twice as much as they gather daily. Verse 6, at evening you shall know that the Lord has brought you out of the land of Egypt. And in the morning you will see the glory of the Lord. In verse 13, he even gives them meat to eat. So that quails came up at evening and covered the camp. And in the morning and the dew lay all around. And when the layer of dew lifted, there was on the surface of the wilderness a small round substance, fine as frost on the ground. When the children of Israel they saw, it, saw it, they said to one another, what is this? They did not know what it was. Moses said, this is the bread the Lord has given you to eat. This is the thing which the Lord has commanded. Notice that. Here's what God's given you, and here's what God's law is about this. Let everyone gather each according to one's need, one omer for each person. Let each man take for those who are in his tent. So the children of Israel did so and gathered some more, some less. When they measured it by omers, he who gathered much had left him nothing left over. He who had gathered little had no lack. Every man gathered according to his needs. And Moses said, let no one leave any of it till morning. Notwithstanding, they did not heed Moses. Some of them left part of it until morning. And it bred worms and it stank. And Moses was angry with 
them. So they gathered it every morning, every man according to his need. Can you imagine what that was like? Every day you get up, sunrise, or whatever time your alarm went off, and you walk out of your tent, and you wait for the dew to dry up. Three million people, 40 years. And you'd go out, and you'd scrape this little substance off the ground. And there was a limitation on how much you could get. You get too much, and you try to save it longer than God said to save it, then it's just going to stink. Nobody wants smelly, rotten food in their tent. And God said, this is what I want you to do. And what he tells them at the very outset is, I'm going to test you whether you're going to obey me or not. There is a fundamental concept that's a part of our covenant with God that is established right here. And that is, God is a God who provides. And we as a people, his provision is contingent upon our compliance. That's what covenant is with God. We need to understand that. Why is it that this obedience stuff is so important? Why does God tell them over and over? When he gets to Mount Sinai, he tells them, look, I'm going to be your God, you're going to be my people, you'll be my priests, you'll be a royal nation to me if you obey my commands, Exodus 19, verses 5 and 6. Why would Solomon, hundreds of years later, say, here's the conclusion of the whole matter, fear God, keep his commandments, this is man's all. Why is obedience so important with God? Because obedience reflects whether we really have faith in God or not. That's what God wants. Everything we're going to talk about this week, every lesson will come back to this concept. Do I trust what God is telling me? This is the challenge for you young folks. Do I trust what God is telling me? And the only way you're going to manifest whether you trust that is by your obedience to what he tells you to do. It's a fundamental concept. We see it all the time. Tori and Emily are part of this congregation now. Growing up, do you trust your daddy? Yes, then do what I tell you to do. We get that. We get it all the time. But when it comes to God, we dismiss his word. And the reason we dismiss his word is because we really don't trust him. Now, we say we trust him. That's, the, 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 that's what's happened in the big religious world out there that David so well described for us. The, the reality is one doesn't happen without the other. Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 6, Without faith it's impossible to please him. He that comes to God must believe that he is and that he's a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. We get this, don't we? Among our brethren, we make this point all the time. And I want you to understand why it is so significant here. Because if God can provide food from nothing... He can give me anything else that I need. That, that's, that's the takeaway for you and I. It was the thing God was trying to establish in their mind. Are you going to obey me? If you don't obey me, it's because you don't trust me. But if you trust me, where's the lesson? You're about to wander in the wilderness, and I know that you're going to spend 40 years there. How are you going to eat? How are you going to feed millions of people in the middle of nowhere? Even when you go to the promised land, Moab's not going to help you. Edom's not going to help you. The Amorites are going to attack you. How are you going to feed your kids? Think about that in practical terms, folks. Those of you who are raising your children, you're living in a tent in the middle of the wilderness. You're wandering around following a pillar of cloud and a pillar of fire. You don't have time to plant crops. There's no way to provide bread for your family. You're going through uninhabited regions. You're not along a trade route where you can buy it. you got to feed your kids. What's the old saying? Baby needs a new pair of shoes. How are you going to do that? You're going to do that because God's going to give you what you need. And so I'm going to get up every day and I'm going to go gather. <clears throat> and on Saturday, I'm not even going to go look for it because he's already told me it's not going to be there. Because that's the day that he wants to give me rest. And he's looking to all 
of the spiritual applications that we understand and it helps us to appreciate what Moses would say 40 years later in Deuteronomy chapter 8 when he looks back upon this. God let you get hungry. God led you these in the wilderness. God did all these things so that you might learn that man doesn't live by bread alone but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. That's the lesson we have to learn because it's not manna in the wilderness that we need, folks. It's forgiveness. How do I know God does that? Well, because I trust him. How do I show that I trust him? Because I do what he tells me to do. How should I or why should I trust in his provision? Because he fed people manna for 40 years in the wilderness and said, this is the basis of our relationship to one another. Are you going to do what I ask you to do? I'll provide. Will you give yourself to my direction? And so if you want to talk about our role as people and the things that Brother Williver talked about, especially at the end of his lesson where we, we look at Acts chapter 2, and most of the people in this audience are very familiar with Acts chapter 2. We're going to pound on Acts chapter 2. Yes, you have to repent. Yes, you have to be baptized. Yes, Jesus has to be Lord in Christ. Yes, we have to meet. Yes, we have to fellowship. Yes, we have to show our love. Yes, we have to take the message out there. Why are you going to conform to the ways of God? Because God has proven himself as one upon whom you may rely. And if he says, look, I'll forgive your sins. I'm going to raise your dead body from the grave. I mean, come on. When Paul preached that in Acts chapter 17 in Greece, they mocked him. What? You're going to raise my dead body? How's that going to work? I don't know how it's going to work, but I know who says it's going to work. And when he tells me this is what I want you to do, he has proven himself and what he wants is my obedience because that shows that I trust him. If he tells me to stand on my head and stack greased BBs, then break out the BBs and give me a wall to lean against because I trust my God to give me what he says he's going to give me. In John chapter 6, that's exactly what Jesus does with this passage. We very often study uh, the, the, the man in passage. We, we, we immediately jump to Jesus who's fed the, the thousands with the loaves and the fishes and he goes across the sea and the multitudes come looking for him and he says, look, you, you're not here because of the signs. You're not here because you believe who I am. You didn't get anything from what happened yesterday. You just want more to eat. Labor for the food that doesn't perish. I'm the bread that came down from heaven. It's no wonder that they walked away and said, man, that's a hard saying. What do you mean, eat your flesh and drink your blood? Do you not understand that what Jesus is telling them is? I'm the key to salvation. And whatever I tell you, You're going to live by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. And our association is based upon that promise and our trust in him, which is shown by our obedience. Does that make sense to you? This is what God wants. He wants us to, to, to trust him to the point that anything he asks us to do. David re referred to Matthew chapter 7 this morning. Not everyone that says to me, Lord, Lord. We very often get to the end of that little section right there and stop before the wise man built his house upon the rock. I don't know why we stop there because it's the most fascinating part of the conclusion of the, of, of the Sermon on the Mount because Jesus says, whoever hears these words of mine and does them. Wait a minute. You're telling me eternal life is based upon me hearing your words and doing them? Yes. How could you do that? Because I'm God and this is what I can provide and this is the condition that I've placed upon it. So if you're a wise man, you build your house on the rock that I have given you. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. So, so here's the question that we ought to address as we consider that concept. 
Do you trust God? And if your reaction is, yeah, I trust God, are you obeying him? It it doesn't matter if it's marriage and divorce or modesty. It doesn't matter if it's how we worship and how the congregation uses its funds and whether or not we are being a family. It doesn't matter if we're talking about the culture we live in and the kind of people that we are to be. We do those things not out of blind obedience, because, but, but, but out of faith. Because we trust that, that, that God's going to reward us, not because we've earned anything or we've built up enough goodwill with God, but because God is God, he's made a promise, and he has shown us. Look, I'm going to ask you to do some crazy things. And you may not understand them all. And I'm going to offer you some even crazier things, and you're really not going to understand all that. But I'm going to teach you to trust me. I want to offer a second observation right quick. Go back to the first 12 verses in this section. We've already read most of them in chapter 16. Everything in the first part of this revolves around their complaint. If you read it carefully, beginning in verse 2, the children of Israel complain. When you get to verse 3, there is the description of the complaint. When you get to verse 6 uh, or verse 7, uh, Moses says to the children, the, the Lord hears your complaints. Why are you complaining against us? Verse 8, the Lord hears your complaints. Your complaints are not against us. Uh, verse 9, he's heard your complaints. Uh, verse 12, I've heard the complaints. The, 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 do you see what's driving the issue here uh, you're grappling and I'm listening you and I would gripe too in fact we gripe about a lot less than that well a storm come through Beaumont Saturday night and uh, I say a little storm we had hurricane force winds in, in, in Lumberton and Lumberton's got a lot of trees and a lot of them went down. And of course, trees that go down always find power lines. And so as of about 8 o'clock Saturday night, we lost our power, and it didn't come back on till the uh, middle of the day Monday. June, the hottest days of the year. <clears throat> oh, and I griped. <laughs> I griped. Why is this power company? They ain't even shown up. It's been a whole day and they're not even here yet. It doesn't take much for us to complain, does it? So, I mean, we tend to be really hard on the children of Israel. They, they, they were very much like us. And I'll tell you, I, it is amazing to me that what Moses says and what God says is, oh, God's listening, God's hearing your complaints. There's some things about the nature of God that I think are, that are revealed in this little section right here that, that, that is important and practical for us to understand. What is the Scripture telling us? Well, God listens to his people. Even when we're griping. Even when we're complaining. Even when life is hard. Even when things don't work out the way we want them to. We pray to God and pray to God and pray to God and pray to God. We've emphasized the importance of doing that. And God tells us to do that. He tells us to go into our closet and pray and that, that he that, 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 that sees in secret will reward us openly. We're told in 1 Peter chapter 3 that God listens to his people. His, his ears are open to our prayers. His eyes are upon the righteous. God listens. Now, now understand, sometimes God says no. Sometimes God says, yes, I'm personally convinced. Sometimes God says, I'm just going to let things play out. We don't always get what we want, but what we understand is that God's listening to us. If there's ever a a period of time in, in kind of our age, and I don't mean the last 20 years, I'm talking about maybe the last couple of hundred since our country has been established and Christianity uh, has, has had a foothold in this world and now we're seeing that wane. If there's ever a time God's people need to be talking to God, it's now. 
And I don't know what all God may or may not do, but I can tell you this much, God wants us to talk to him even when things aren't the way we want them to be. This is a fundamental concept. This is what the Scripture's telling us. God is listening. And it's also telling us that God is a God who, by virtue of his nature, wants to provide for his people. For us, we see this in passages like Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who's blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. Man, we miss the depth of that. There is no blessing of a spiritual nature that God has not given us. Not that he's not going to give us, that he has not given us now. This is the God we serve. This is why obedience is important. This is why faith is important, because this is who God is. Even to a people that don't appreciate him and don't know him yet, who just complain and gripe all the time, he is a being who wants to bless. We need to see that. We need to preach that. This is how the broken are, are healed and, and how people see transformation in local congregations because we understand that God is a God who provides, e even if it is something as outlandish. Yeah, every morning when the dew drives, there's going to be bread on the ground. Go pick it up and bake it. You can live on that. And we also see that God's patient. You know, as you go forward through the Exodus story, over the next 40 years, there are a couple of occasions where manna is mentioned, especially in the book of Numbers. Right before they get to the promised land to send the spies out, they become frustrated with God because the way is hard and the wilderness is hard, and they complain about the manna. Our soul hates this worthless manna. How can you say that when that's all you got to eat? And then again, after the 40 years, they begin complaining to God about their circumstances. And once again, wish we were back in Egypt where we had stuff to eat besides this stinking manna. It's interesting, God says, hey, it tasted like wafers made with honey. Forty years. Who knows how many other times? <laughs> you remember when you were a kid, we, growing up in Lubbock, we didn't, have, we didn't have a whole bunch. I didn't understand it then, but, you know, we, we, we ate hot dog weenies cut down the middle with a little piece of cheese in them. I thought that was the greatest stuff in the world. I didn't realize that was just because we didn't afford anything else. But if I had to eat that every day as a kid, I know what I'd say. I'd walk in at, at, at the end of the day, Mom, are we having weenies and cheese again? Forty years. God listened to their kids come in and go, Manna again? Really? But he put up with them. He tolerated them. Because as he tells them when he brings them to the mountain and gives them the Ten Commandments, I, I'm a God that shows mercy on generations who do my will. I am a long-suffering God. I am a kind God. I am a patient God. What does that say to us? What, well, it says that life, when it's hard and you get griping and you don't like the way things are going, you don't like your circumstance, your air conditioner's busted, You keep on talking to God. Maybe things will get better and maybe they won't. But God is not going to send thunderbolts down upon you because you had a bad day and you became frustrated with your circumstance and you turned to God and you said, I just don't get why this is happening to me. God is not going to cast his people away that quickly, folks. We desperately need that confidence in him. And we need to understand that that is what he is illustrating in this passage. Here's the nature of God. I listen, I provide, I am patient. And, and here's the thing that gets me as much as anything else. I'm going to prove myself to you. 
again in verses 6 and 7. In the evening you shall know the Lord has brought you out of the land of Egypt. In the morning you shall see the glory of the Lord. In verse 10, it came to pass as Aaron spoke to the congregation, they looked toward the wilderness and behold, the glory of the Lord appeared in the cloud. You shall know that I am Yahweh your God. <clears throat> If I didn't know you and you didn't know me, and I came up and said to you, I'll tell you what, I've heard good things about you. I'm going to give you a million dollars. But here's what I want you to do. I want you to get on a bicycle. I want you to ride to Beaumont, Texas and back. You got two days to do it. Remember, you don't know me. Would you get on the bicycle? Not, not if you have any wisdom about you at all. Now, if you knew me and you knew I was trustworthy, that'd be a whole different story. But, but how would you know that I was trustworthy? In fact, you might say, why, why should I do that? I don't know who you are. I don't know if you got any money. I don't know if, you, if you're honest. I don't know if you would fulfill your promise. And so what I said was, well, let let me prove myself to you. And, and so I showed you my bank account. I brought in witnesses and said, here are people that have known me all my life. Uh, tell them that I'm trustworthy. Tell them I'll really do this. And perhaps when I provided enough evidence, you would trust me. Have you ever stopped and considered that the power of God has manifested over and over and over and over and over and over in the Bible for one reason? Because he's proving himself to us. I look at that, there's a part of me that goes, I'm ashamed of that. <laughs> I'm ashamed that the creator of the universe with the power of uh, that, that, that un, unimaginable, unlimited power at his disposal, would have to prove himself to me. And yet he has done so. That's what he's doing with these people in the morning. When I'm done with you, you're going to know that I am Yahweh. I'm going to appear in the cloud. You're going to see my glory. And he does that. Why? So that they would trust him. I'm, I'm going to tell you, folks, the miracles that Jesus does in the New Testament, the signs that are to point us to, 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 as, as evidence that, that he is God in the flesh. He did that just so you and I will look at that and go, okay, I'd like a, a little eternal life. I'd like a resurrected body. Crazy as it may sound, I want to spend eternity in heaven and be reunited with my loved ones. I want to see the face of God. I want him to wipe away the tears from my eyes. I'd really like to have a lot of that. And if God tells me that I have to maintain my marriage vows for the rest of my life, then that's what I'm going to do because I trust what he tells me to do. And if God tells me I need to dress modestly, that's what I'm going to do because I trust him because he has proven himself. What a shame it is that we are such unbelieving people that God would feel the need to come to the earth, send his son to spend three years doing good just so you and I would believe. But that's what's happening here, and it's what happens through the rest of the Scriptures. Because that's who God is. So in this passage, we see the importance of obedience as it relates to trust. And we see a little bit of who God is. We're going to talk about that again in, in the morning. And, and, and I'll offer this one last observation. I'm not going to elaborate upon it. But I want you to appreciate that the power that God manifests here defies any kind of natural law. You, you look at the... The, the Exodus miracles, the plagues. And, and I've seen this my whole life. People will say, well, here's what happened when the water turned to blood. You really have an algae bloom in the Nile River. And, and in algae bloom in the Nile River, it turns the river, uh, you know, to kind of red, takes all the oxygen out of the water. What happens is the fish die. And when the fish die, 
the river becomes polluted and the next thing you know, all the frogs come out. And when the frogs die because the river is polluted, then you start getting flies everywhere. And here we go. It's just one. Now disease is producing boils that eventually produces a pestilence on the animals. And it's thunderstorm season. They just happen to have a really bad thunderstorm, hail and lightning, and a locust plague flies in right in behind that. All explainable natural events. Somebody explain to me manna every day but Saturday for 40 years. Nothing about this is explainable. Nothing about this is natural. So why is this important? Because the miraculous element of the scriptures is an important part of our faith. We need to understand it, and you guys especially need to understand it. Do not be ashamed to believe that God has exercised his power upon this earth outside of normal events on your behalf. Because what the world is saying is the Bible's just a bunch of fables and fairy tales and it is unreliable and all the miracle stuff, do you really believe that? That stuff doesn't really happen. But it did really happen. There is eyewitness evidence. There is a nation of Israel that comes out of Egyptian captivity. The only explanation is the miraculous power of God. And it's important to us because... Faith is the substance of things we hope for and the evidence of things we don't see. These kinds of miracles are here so that we can understand that God does other miracles that we can't see and that the Bible is reliable. And I don't care who attacks your God or how much science tries to tell you that evolution is a, is, is a reasonable thing. It is a faith-based system. Our system is a faith-based system, and there is more evidence for what we believe than all the hogwash that science is teaching in colleges these days. Eyewitness evidence. Fulfilled prophecy. Constant archaeological evidence that's uncovered. The manuscript of the scriptures. What says the scriptures? Well, I'll tell you what it says. It says the same thing, exactly the same thing that it said for two or three or four thousand years. The Dead Sea Scrolls prove that. There is power here. Power that you and I need. Power that is evidenced by a very simple miracle that God does that lasts for 40 years, telling these people, look, go pick it up on this day, but don't pick it up on this day because I'm going to test your faith because what you really need to understand is you don't live by this bread, you live by what I say. And that's who we are, folks. We are people who live by what God says, no matter what anybody else says. No matter what your pastor says in, in some mega church, no, no matter what somebody writes, no matter what you find in, in, in some social media, no matter what the educational system tells us, no matter what anybody tells us, we are people who live by the Word of God, every Word of God. So may we come to Him as those who are laboring and weary because he offers rest to our souls. And we believe that. And we trust that. We live the lives we live because he reigns bread from heaven. God help us to live lives of faith. If you're subject to the invitation tonight, you need to obey your God. And let me tell you, don't tell me you have faith if you won't do what he tells you to do. If you need to obey your God, we can help you. We invite your response while we gather we stand and sing.
reasons our people love the lectures year after year is because they give to us a new appreciation of an old passage or a better understanding of verses we read before. And Russ has done that for us tonight. What a first day we've had together. You'll notice in your brochure there is a form for filling out uh, if you'd like CDs or DVDs of the lectures. There's a box you can place that in in the foyer. You can find the same form online if you'd like to submit it electronically. We're happy to provide these free of charge if, uh, if you'd like for yourself or some, someone else who wants to know what says the scripture. Brother Stevens is going to lead us in a final song. And then uh, I'm going to ask Russ's co-laborer, Devin, if he'll come and lead our dismissal prayer. And we'll be right back at it in the morning to hear these same two speakers. So just reverse the order of today. Russ, keep the microphone on. You'll need it in the morning. And uh, four more great sermons on what says the Scripture. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. God will take care of you. Let's go to God in prayer. Father God, we thank you for the opportunity we've had to come together tonight to sing songs of praise to your great and holy name. We thank you for the opportunity to listen to what your book says, that we might be better servants of yours in this darkened world of sin. Help us, Father, to remember that you provide, to lean upon you, to trust your book, and to never depart from it. We ask that you'd bless this congregation, the efforts being made this week, bless this congregation and their shepherds, and pray that you'll watch over all of us as we strive to be your people. We ask this in the name of Christ, your Lord, or our Lord and, your, and our Savior. Amen.